Um, all right. Hi, this is uh, Casey Carpenter with uh, ChuckPolitik.net, here with Dave Cullum, author of Columbine. Hi. And uh, we are in his writing studio in <clears throat> Denver, Colorado. In Denver, yeah. I can say Denver, Colorado, so the stalkers know where to start. Oh, right, exactly. Yeah, good. Um, anyway, so we're going to start in with the usual uh, the q and I guess everyone's first question, and the most obvious, is why Columbine, of all subject matter? Right, and I'd never been... Particularly interested in school shootings. Uh, this wasn't a fascination of you. <laughs> no. No, it hadn't been. In fact, I almost felt guilty between school shootings, plane crashes. Actually, those were my two biggest news stories where I sort of turned away and just didn't want to hear. Because uh, I felt like there was nothing I could understand or learn. It was a tragedy that was over with. And um, I never paid attention to them. And this one, I just went out because it was here to cover it for Salon.com. I went out just as it was getting started. Didn't actually didn't think it would be anything when I drove out there because there were no reports of injuries yet. So you had just heard about it breaking out on the news and uh, thought, on, on TV, I'm yeah. going to ring up the editor at Salon and say, hey. I did. I'd done one story for her. I left a voicemail that day, really apologetically, saying, oh, this is probably nothing. Sort of sorry for bugging you in San Francisco. But, um, you yeah, know, this is a school shooting. If it turns into something, there's no injuries. But if it is, if it's a national story, I'll be there. Um, and drove out there. And I didn't really know where it was, and some friends gave me some ideas, so I drove out Highway 6 until um, I saw a, hel a ring of helicopters circling um, to the south, which looked really ominous, and that was my first clue. Oh, this, is, this is really bad. And yeah. uh, I just got off the next exit. I literally drove toward the helicopters, and I drove until I hit, hit a police barricade. Yeah. And then I parked my car at a strip mall, got out, and ran on foot. Um, and cause you, you could go a lot closer by foot, they uh, sure. uh, didn't have a, a much tighter uh, pedestrian ring. And I went and um, really, that day, and it was the next morning that um, that I really got hooked, just meeting the people. Um, for me, it was completely different. Once I got to know the people involved, the story did matter to me. I did understand you know, individual lives being impacted by this in horrible ways and uh, horrible in really different ways. And for me, some unexpected ways. You know, I wrote this chapter vacant, because uh, I had the vacant stares, uh, uh, vacant emotionally, kids the next morning, yeah. they literally changed overnight. Um, uh, the morning after Columbine, well, well, the day that it happened, Clement Park, where, where all the kids were, I mean, it was chaotic, people were running around screaming, they were hugging each other, and I mean, they would grab each other like for dear life and just <laughs> clench. Yeah. Um, the next morning, none of that, nobody was crying. And the boys in particular were um, not really emoting at all. They were just like these uh, zombies. Um, and that, that scared the crap out of me. And I, I didn't know what was going to happen with them, and it was scaring the crap out of them. I talked to them about it, and um, at first, you know, I didn't want to be the jerk reporter, um, you know, and ask, oh, how, how come you boys aren't crying? But so it took me a little while to figure out, like, uh, and I actually asked a group of the guys, like, have you noticed some of the guys aren't really crying? Um... And to my surprise, uh, they said yes, and they really wanted to talk about it because it had happened to all of them. And almost all of them could tell you, like, the time it happened. So nobody had gone to sleep. So they could say, like, 3 in the morning. I just stopped crying. I stopped feeling anything. Mm -hmm. And it was all different times, but almost everybody had had the same experience where um, your psyche just shuts down and just goes numb, and you, you can't take anymore, so it's a defense mechanism. Yeah. Um, and that, it turns out that's very common, usually not this universally, but it was such an overwhelming experience that it happened to almost everyone there. Um, so you had a whole campus full of kids that were just quiet as church you, Yes, exactly, which yeah. is a really unsettling feeling when you're around them, and it feels... When you high school feel, kids, that should be... Yes, it should be a lot of horseplay, and, and also... And yeah, it does feel like you're in a Stepford village or something. Um, and they felt it too, and were knew something was wrong... Um, one of the first things that impressed me and throughout is how articulate the kids turned out to be about their situation. And I was so impressed they could always tell you what was going on with them. They were very candid about telling you they didn't know what was going to happen. They didn't know the answers. And they were hungry for adults to tell them, why is this happening to me? What's going to happen? Um, hungry for knowledge. So, but the adults were going to know for the answer. Yeah, they, 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 didn't, know, they didn't know either. Um, I mean, some of the psychologists and psychiatrists that were brought in did, who, you know, studied Vietnam vets and right. people through war and tragedies. PTSD, yeah, yeah, PTSD through the beginning of time. Um, but commonly, you know, the teachers didn't know faculty. I mean, people, 
most people don't know this stuff. Um, but the, the kids knew what they were going through, but they didn't know the answers. Um, but yeah, they were really articulate about talking about it. And you know, I was, you know, I was just sucked in from 24 hours in. I just, uh, I didn't know I was going to be writing a book about it, but I knew I was fascinated by these people, and I didn't. And before you knew you were going to do a book about it. You finally got the call back from the salon. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. And she tells you what? Oh, well, yeah. The, yeah, the first day when I was out there, I finally got her on a payphone because I didn't have a cell phone yet. Um, this is 1999, and I was poor. And yeah, exactly. Um, and uh, God, about three or four hours into it, um, I called and said, uh, "So are you going to want a story today?" And she said, "We've got the cover mapped out for you. <laughs> you know, you have to have copy." No PC. And uh, yeah, and I hadn't brought my PC because I didn't think it would be anything. And um. Yeah. I had my little micro cassette recorder and a little notepad and a pen. Old school. And yeah, and and, um, and so they had a guy. They found a headset um, where I called the story in, and I wrote a bunch of copy. Um, it turned out not to be nearly enough. Plus, they had lots of questions. They sent me back out. God, by about six or seven o'clock at night, uh, I had to run like half a mile. I was ten years younger then, eleven years younger, half a mile to this uh, uh, payphone and back. So I would I. I made that run two or three times. Um, <laughs> well, I'd run back, it literally ran. Yeah. Um, Panty had like phoned in my copy. Then they had a lot of questions and a lot of other things that had been coming around in the news they wanted me to check on. Hold on, let me go run and check on that. I went back and then I'd spent like an hour. But I spent like an hour gathering, yeah. well, gathering yeah. more and writing new copy, yeah. sort of thinking it through and building more. Then came back. That happened about two or three times. I'm like, okay, enough of that. Well, plus it was deadline. It took us to. Um, I think I left there at like 9 p.m. or something, my time, our time here, and they post at 10 o'clock because it's midnight New York is right. when they do the new story. So, yeah, they had like an hour to get it through copy editing and get it, you know, production on, on the site. Wow. Um, so we had to be done. <laughs> yeah. um, so from this yeah, blossoms a project yeah. that consumes you for 10 years. <laughs> Um, right, you know, but in in two to three year and sometimes one year increments. Right. Like I didn't know that I was gonna, I wasn't yeah. planning to spend ten years on. You didn't it, know but, immediately that this is gonna be a, a decade work, but it took you that long to get what no one else has gotten up to this point, media wise, reporting, journalists, whatever, as far as access, as far as uh, the information, as far as uncovering uh, the things that we didn't know, mm -hmm. like uh, some of the goings on with uh, the police and whatnot. Mm -hmm. or, some of the actual uh, uh, petty crimes that led up to this mm -hmm. between Eric and Dylan and that sort of thing. Well, and to be to be candid, almost mo most of that stuff, the bits of it came out, it come out, and some of those stories I broke, and you know most of them I didn't. Um, but I had some big early stories of Cassie Bernal, the Christian Martin not being true, the first uh, leaked passages from Eric's journal. So I had my share, but most of the stuff had come out by the time the book came out. But I remember having a conversation with my agent who's wonderful, she used to be executive editor at Double Day, she's a great editor, Betsy Lerner, um, you know, about what it's about and, you know, and why people will be reading this. And, you know, she said, you know, you've got all this stuff. It's the first time this gigantic story is all in one place. Yeah. And the tapestry is huge. The, the cast is enormous. Um, and it's a very complicated tale with all these tales interwoven into one gigantic story. But We've never seen it all put together in one place. Well, you've before. got what ten concurrent storylines? Nine, yeah, nine. nine. Yeah, ten of you count each of the killers, but okay. I think of them as one. But um, so that right there is uh, a lot of work yeah. to get those concurrent and to make sense. And then you've got how many sub chapters this thing is divided into? Uh, it ended up being about fifty some. Yeah. I wrote I, I had like a hundred and eight or hundred and nine. And that's what um, came in. And then started condensing, yeah. And I, I knew, I knew that's too much. Yeah. You know, it's interesting. I also knew, well, we had nine hundred pages. Well, um, you've been pretty effective in fat gathering, and so you had to kind of mm -hmm. condense. Yeah, and it's interesting. Um, you know, we five years in, I totally threw out what I had been doing for the five years. Started over, reconceived it. Um, it had been originally a project for Random Houses at Random Division. It was going to be an ebook and then trade paperback for them. Um, that died after two or three years. Just wasn't so, working.